much higher spread uh, at the two-month forecast. And, you know, if you're using this as a hard rule, well, that's not truly a shedding event because that should be a close contour if it is. But anyway, I said, yeah, I, I, you know, I really think the shedding event is imminent. And, you know, uh, as a forecaster, people said, man, you're really willing to stick your neck out if you're going to make a two-month prediction like that. But that's what they're paying me to do, so that's what we did. Um, and they were particularly interested in this time frame because <clears throat> they were installing a, a deep leg or a, a, a deep tension leg platform um, called Jack St. Malo. It's in this location. This was the analysis on June 8th. And this was the forecast for August 3rd, two months later. And boom, they were really worried about hauling or towing this big, huge thing out there on a the barge. Um, and that's, that, that's just corresponds to this location. So we, you know, they said, look, this one's an important one. We really start, need to take a close look at it. So I'm just going to go through some of 2014. Um, what I'm showing here are the SSH analyses. There's no forecasts on this plot. It starts on April 20th, and I'm just showing you weekly snapshots of the analyses or what we think the ocean really looks like on those days. So I boxed this one because it actually shed an eddy. I want to look at that event, and you know we're just marching on week by week in time until we get to um, July 20th, uh, and then there's another shedding event. Okay, so these these are just a sequence of the of the height fields. And it just continues on. Um, this is uh, August 10th, and then this was just a few weeks ago, uh, September 14th. So, like I said earlier, I alluded to anyway. The oops. The uh, loop current extension has been doing some, you know, some pretty complicated things the last couple of months. It shed, okay, and then it reattached. And then it reshed, okay, and it's reattaching again, okay, <laughs> in this really funny way. And so now it's so it's undergone, you know. And we, we all know that it, you know this is pretty common, but not three or four within one cycle. So it's you know it shed, it reattached, it shed, it reattached, it shed, it reattached. This is a really uh, tough, it makes it tough to do a, a forecast. So I just want to show you the time dependence of the predictability. And so I'm showing you the analysis on July 13th, July 20th, 27th, August 3rd, and August 10th of this year, okay? And this was one of those boxed um, height maps that showed a loop current eddy shedding event. We went from that state to that state. This is what the analysis says. We believe the analysis. We Accept it as truth because it has assimilated all of the observations. So this, we went back one week. We ran a one-week forecast. So this is a one-week forecast, okay? We think we do pretty well one week out. And, in fact, if you compare this one-week forecast with the analysis week by week, even the amplitude, everything looks pretty good. Uh, now we're going to go one month out. We're going to look at a one-month forecast instead of a one-week forecast. And that's what's here. Okay, so now I'm going to compare this one-month forecast to that analysis. Yeah, this one had already shed. Uh, well, it's not too bad. You know, I'm seeing things that I can live with here. I mean, that, that looks pretty much like that. Now we're going to go out two months, okay? And this is where I really kind of start to lose it. We're not doing well with the predictability out to two months. We're doing pretty good out one month. But then when we get out two months, we're just... We're not doing that good. The primary reason is that, and this is common, when the loop current sheds an eddy, the extension off, often snaps back to the south like, the, like it did, like it did here, okay? In reality, that didn't happen. It, it maintained this, this northward penetrating loop current extension even though it had shed this, this uh, eddy up here. But it snapped all the way back, and so the two-month prediction wasn't able to do this, this reattachment, okay? Um, so in this case... Let's see, I've got one more column there. Yeah, and this is just the, the ensemble uh, spread or, or uncertainty. So in this case, you know, I would argue that we did quite well out to one month, and then we just didn't do well uh, when we w tried to go out to two months. <coughs> and now I'm just going to do one, one more sequence. So this is, I'm just going on in time. It's August 17th through September 14th. And 
This was when we saw the reattachment of that little eddy. The, new, the loop current extension went out there, grabbed it, reattached it, and there it is. And one week out, um, we don't really get that, but okay, it's been reabsorbed, and, and these look pretty good. So one week out is pretty good. Um, two weeks, or one month out, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, we've still got some remnant out there that's not quite realistic. But one month out, I'm, 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 I'm not going to complain too much. There are some differences, but overall, I think it's not bad. But once again, we get out to two months, and we don't do that well. And uh, the, again, the primary reason is that we, we start to do better, and that's because the, the loop current extension starts to penetrate to the northwest uh, again. And, but we just don't capture like this event here. So we do okay in the, in the one month prediction, but two months out, we're not, you know, those look quite different. And I would say that that's not a good forecast. And I think you would probably agree. So there's, there's during 2014, during this detachment, retachment, detachment, retachment sequence, it's been a very challenging prediction environment, I guess I would say, but you know, one month out, it, we can at least give you guidance for a month, but out to two months, then we're kind of losing it. And I'm going to finish up here. I think I've got just one more slide. Um, so this is, uh, this is the latest eight-week forecast. Uh, not the latest. It was run on the 14th, so it was run a couple weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, just, I'm sorry I didn't have time to update it. But here's the analysis. Here's the one-week forecast, two-week forecast. And I'm just trying to give, give everybody an, you know, an idea of, so, okay, what's going to happen? Is it really going to shed this time? Well, this is, the, uh, this is the forecast for this November, November 9th, coming up about a month from now. And it just shows that the northern gulf is going to remain energetic, and this thing is going to kind of continue to be indecisive about whether or not it wants to truly shed an eddy or not. It looks like it might go through yet another detachment, reattachment process. But only time will really tell. Yep, so the summary, um, I mean, it's kind of boilerplate. We've developed a system that shows qualitative and quantitative skill. I mean, we could argue about how quantitative it is, but at least we did anomaly correlations, and we showed you some hard numbers, and, you know, there, there they are. Um, it's been in running in real time for almost two years now, um, and we, we continue to run it. We make products, um, both just plots and animations, but we also do statistical or probabilistic risk assessment products. We put those to the web. And, you know, especially in 2014, there's more that we can do. I mean, this was our first attempt at putting together a long, you know, a long-term, a two-month prediction system. Um, you can use advanced statistical techniques to actually extract more useful information from the ensemble population. Um, we can do calibration based on yesterday's or last week's forecast. If, if, if you have drift or you have bias, you can calibrate it back so that you stay on, on the best trajectory possible. Um, and yeah, we're, this is just, we're trying to transition this as a, as a Navy operational system, but that's a formal process that takes time and the Gulf of Mexico isn't their highest priority. That's it. So questions. <laughs> I meant to go 45 minutes, but a little bit long. Yes. No, for for the behavior that yeah, I don't, I, you know that that's some kind of dynamical instability. What you know is is there something funny going on in the bottom currents that are uh, no? I mean, I have ideas, I guess, but they're I can't back them up, and um, I, I'm not familiar with the temperature anomaly. Well, so, a lot of warm water. So okay, yeah. So I'll stick my neck out and say maybe you know has the has the overall volume transport through the Yucatan Channel increased and is it bringing more water in from the Caribbean and is that you know I, I don't know I mean um, you know this is just a forecast system it's not 
yeah, you can use it to try to understand and unravel the dynamics. Um, but no, I, I don't. I, you know, I'd just be speculating, um, and I wasn't really sure. I, I wasn't aware of the uh, temperature anomaly that you talked about. But um, you know, the, it's not uncommon to see these reattachment, detachment, reattachment. But I've never seen one happen three times in, in one cycle. You know, and I've, or, and I've, I don't think. Bob Lieben, who analyzes all this altimetry, he's been looking at it for 20 years, and I don't think he's ever seen anything like it either. It's a very unusual, uh, this, yeah, not short, that's a long, rambling answer. No, I don't, sorry. <laughs> yes? Um, how long are you anticipating it's going to take to shift it over to an average node to be operational? Well, um, so we have to go through a formal process. Um, when, when I say we make something operational, we have to validate it. We have a validation test panel that we see. We go through a rigorous um, validation phase where we, you know, we get together with NAVO. We set up metrics, and then we all agree on this is what we're going to do. This is how good it has to be. It has to show this kind of skill against this metric. Um, they agree on it, and then they do, they do their own independent op test. And, um, and then there's uh, uh, what we call AMOP, an admi uh, administrative modeling oversight panel. They have to agree, okay, it's technology readiness levels. You know, I mean, how long, if, 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 if they were interested, if this was a, a product of high interest, we could probably get it done in six months. Um, because this area isn't an area, uh, this region isn't an area of high Navy interest. They're kind of dragging their feet, and they're like, well, we have other bigger fish to deal with right now. So... I don't know if it'll ever actually make it over there operationally, but, you know, we can continue to run it in real time. Um, it just takes the onus off of me having to run it. And, you know, once they accept something, operate, then it's there, they own it. And we can use all of their equipment and all of their generators. And, you know, because I can't guarantee this. You know, we had a computer failure a couple of weeks back. and yeah, But I don't know. Uh, the normal process might be six months. This process might be a lot longer. Yeah, um, Dennis, I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's a forecast model. Yeah. And I'm not intimately familiar with the literature uh, regarding eddy shedding yeah. physics in the Gulf. So my question is, does this model allow you to investigate um, uh, physics of eddy shedding? Or based on what we already know, which I'm ignorant of, uh, you've already incorporated that in your model. Yeah, absolutely. You can absolutely use use this model to investigate the dynamics of loop current eddy shedding or the dynamics of flow along the West Florida Shelf or anything else. This is a first principles full full equation thermodynamic for, you know circulation model. Um, it's got based on the Navier Stokes equations. It's got a continuity equation, the momentum equations. Absolutely. And in fact, you don't even need the ensembles. Just give me the probability of uncertainty. You can just take one run. And, and try to use that to identify the actual physical well, nonlinear process of what actually uh, sheds it. If, I, I don't know. I've, no. I've never read a paper about it. Maybe they're out there. I don't know. Oh, there's paper. There's a I'm there's sure a lot of ideas. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so no, no, no. It's, it, I understand. Um, the answer to the first part of your question is, yeah, this model is is absolutely um, qualified or absolutely a good tool for understanding those. I haven't done it, okay, I just built it to be a, a forecast model, um, but a really good grad student or, uh, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, what is the mechanism loop of loop current eddy shedding? Man, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of theories flow through the Yucatan, the deep, the deep flow in the interior of the basin. Um, is it really wind driven? I don't think it is, but, you know, it's, a, it's an instability of some sort. You can use it. I haven't done it, and so I'm not going to sit up here. I'm not going to stand up here and say, "Hey, based on these model results, I think the loop current sheds eddies because of this." No, I don't. I don't know that. But you could absolutely use this model to do that. Well, I'm going to go in the back first. Yeah. Do you have any speculations of why these uh, detachments occur three times in a row? Uh, what physical reason might be? Not. No. Not really. I mean, that, that's. I think it's directly related to to this question here. Not really. No. And I, and I haven't looked, to be perfectly honest with you, right? I mean, I've just been focused on, you know, do we have predictability? And, um, and that, that's, I, you know, as a researcher, I would love to be able to take a month off and dig into that question. I mean, absolutely. 
um, but not really. And you know, hearing the, the, the comment about the temperature anomaly, that that's, might be an interesting piece, but no. Although it's rare, it's rare I can say that. I've never, like I said, I've ne not seen uh, it happen three times in a row in one cycle. I know, Yellen Gong's, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah, the long range uh, forecast is interesting. Um, but I'm wondering what kind of, what exactly the force and field you use for those uh, uh, two months forecast period? So, um, yeah. Yeah, maybe you mentioned that. Maybe yes, I okay. That, uh, but uh, what kind of, um, and open right. So we took 10 years of output from the global forecast system, and we made, <coughs> we made a daily climatology over 10 years. So it's what I call a high-frequency climatology, a synoptic climatology. It, so it doesn't smear things out like a monthly mean would. It retains some of the synoptic character. And we did the same thing for the atmosphere. We took nine years of output from one of the Navy's no gaps atmospheric models, and we did a three hourly climatology. We took the mean of January 1st, 00Z, so there's nine instances of it. So we made, we, it's climatology, but it's high frequency climatology, that's correct. So, yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, the ensemble forecasts you use perturbations, uh, are the perturbations based on the natural variability in the surface forcing and boundary forcing? or uncertainties in those, or what, what were the perturbations? Perturbations are based on the forecast error variance of yesterday's forecast. Okay. So we look at the forecast errors from yesterday, and then we use the magnitude of those forecast errors. We use an ensemble transform to generate perturbations that we then apply to the initial conditions. Mm -hmm. So we start with 32 perturbed states mm -hmm. that all have variance that is scaled by yesterday's forecast error. Okay. And then we also perturb the surface forcing, like through this, this think of it as a rubber sheet, like a, a space-time deformation. So if the, the, we have an atmospheric front here, we just offset it by a few grid points in X and Y, and we offset it in time by an hour. Mm -hmm. So we do that 32 different times. I mean, we have an algorithm that generates these perturbations. So we're perturbing both the surface forcing and both the initial conditions. We're not perturbing the boundary, the, the lateral boundary conditions. We're not perturbing the model physics. There are more things, you know, there are different ways to do this. So you're not looking at all, for example, in the interannual variability that might be No. no well, we're, the boundary conditions are, the, the long-term boundary conditions are climatological. Yeah. Now, yeah, so that, that's right. Now, we're, we're, you know, we're running the system in real time. So the analysis is based on, interannual, you know, we run an analysis today, it's what the observations say it is. The forecast is based on climatology, but the daily analysis is actually based on whatever observations we have. So this, if this is an anomalous year, it'll be captured in, the, in that analysis. So in other words, starting in January of 2013, we've been running daily, every day, okay, and then once a week we fire off a long-term forecast. So that daily analysis is going to have any interannual variability in it. But, for example, if you're doing a forecast into November... Forecast will not capture it. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. No. There's a lot of natural variability. But if it's in the initial state, you might... Yeah, if the forecast won't get the interannual variability because it doesn't... Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> That's good. Just, uh, I was just curious. Um, you were talking about how you, uh, the observations you get tend to be kind of more or less accurate depending on the source. Like you are talking about how like uh, gliders tend to be a little more high resolution or more yeah. than satellite data. Mm -hmm. So for the model, are these observations like weighted at all differently in terms of their input to the model based on the source? Um, each, each sensor has its own uh, what we call uh, observation error covariance or obs observation error. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and they're weighted by the age if they come in a little bit late and they're five days old, we would give them less weight because they're older. Um, but there's an error level associated with each. Each one has its own error model. But as far as differential weighting based on sensor type, no. An SST is going to be as valuable as a, as a height anomaly, as valuable as a in situ profile. So the sensor type, the observation types are not but they do get weighted differently based on their air characteristics or the age that they come in or, or something like that, maybe. Yes, sir. Uh, relating to the previous question, uh, have you ever tried or have any plans of trying a 4D bar type data simulation? Or would that be too expensive? 
Well, no, I mean, 40 var will not give you the uncertainty. Okay, it'll give you the time dependent flow, time and flow dependent. I understand. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, right. Um, some other folks at NRL have actually developed a 40 var system for the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but again, um, I prefer the ensemble approach because the ensemble gives you the forecast uncertainty. The 40 var does not give you the forecast uncertainty. That's the main re I mean, that's why I'm, you know, I wanted to get uncertainty so I could do risk management maps, things like that. You don't get that from the 40 var. And it is a lot more expensive, that's, that's true. Um, and the other thing is for 40 var, you have to have an adjoint model and a tangent linear model, and um, those can be challenging to develop too. So there's reasons why we've chosen this particular approach, but we don't we, we pay attention to 40 var too. Absolutely. One more. <laughs> no. One more last question. Uh, Boris. Uh, it's very impressive what you can do with this. Uh, Thanks. Did you try to change to check sensitivity to this thirty-two? Um, yeah, so early on we did. Um, you know, 32 is a nice computer integer, of course. But uh, we early on when we were setting everything up, before we started running in real time, we did a case with 16, 32, and 48. And we saw quite a bit of change going from 16 to 32. We saw some change but less change going from 32 to 48. We didn't see enough change that we felt it justified the increase in the computer time that was required to run an additional 16 members. And so we just made the decision saying, okay, we think 30, you know, is it optimal? We haven't done a formal convergent study or anything like that. Um, but we did one study where we just com did what I described and we just didn't think it justified the increased costs. So 32 was... 32, for whatever, for various regions, for whatever reason, kind of seems to be, at least for these regional applications, kind of the sweet spot. I, um, just one last thing. I, so I'm, I'm proposing to expand this capability to the global ocean. I don't think 32 members is going to be enough. The, dy the, the dynamical modes that you have to cover, the wide range, much wider range of dynamical modes that you have to cover. Gulf of Mexico is like three, three basic modes. It's either separated. It's not, or it's somewhere in the middle. I mean, those are the three basic modes that you have. In the, in the global ocean, you have a huge, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but in the global ocean, you have this huge spectrum of but, but, but modes. But how many uh, ensembles do they typically have when they do the climate model ensembles? It's not much more than 32, probably. Uh, 200? Yeah. They, they, they do try to run with more, but, but yeah, but it, it might not be enough. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's a third. No, by definition, we don't have boundary conditions in the global model. But, yeah, yeah. But we have surface boundary conditions, but we have no lateral boundary conditions. But we're not perturbing the lateral boundary conditions here. That, in my mind, that just removes um, a, uh, a problem or a source of error. So we don't have to worry about climatological boundary conditions. I mean, yeah. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a big, huge problem. I mean, right now it takes a lot of time to do one global run. And if now I'm telling them that we, telling them that we want to do 32 of them. But um, I'm not going 